So, uh, yeah, cool. Because um, it's, uh, we're not done, and, uh, and uh, I, I, I don't like them. Okay, um, let's go ahead and get started. So we have um, the first talk of this session is Refinement Ties for Hat for Hat School, and the speaker is Nikki Basu. Hi, I'm Nikki Basu from UC San Diego, and I'm going to present Refinement Ties for Haskell, a joint work of me, Eric Sender, Razi Jalla, immediately between others, and Simon Peter Jones. So a refinement type is just a Haskell type refined with a predicate drawn from a logical sub language. For example, this refinement type describes values p that are integers, and the refinement constrains these values to be greater than zero. We can use refinement types to <coughs> give functions preconditions. For example, here we refine the type of the divisor operator and constrain the second argument to be always greater than zero. Now in the rest of the talk, I'm going to abbreviate refinement types and just keep the basic type when it's clear from the content. So given this type for the divisor operator, a function that uses d is OK if and only if its second argument is always greater than 0. For example, function good is OK because it divides its argument x with a value 10, but function bad creates a refinement type error because it divides its argument x with 0. So refinement types have been used to prove more interesting properties than just the vision shape. For example, they have been used to prove array safety in ML. They have been used to prove correctness of security protocols in F star and compiler correctness in F star. So we said, given the, the <coughs> expressiveness of refinement types, we said, OK, let's build refinement types for Haskell. So it turns out that this was a little bit tricky because all the values that have refinement types implemented assume call by value evaluation, while Haskell has call by need evaluation. And to see why this makes a big difference, we define a function pxpin that recursively calls itself, and we refine the result type of spin with a predicate false, which means that all the values that spin return satisfy the predicate false. This is OK because spin does not actually return any value. So given this type of spin and the type of the divisor operator, we define a function ugly that assigns 0 to y assign z to the result of spin. And the question here is, is this function OK, or should it create a refinement type error? So if we assume call by value evaluation, this function is OK, because execution will try to, to compute the result of spin, so it will get stuck. And it will never reach the divisor by 0 operation. So <coughs> but if we have call by need evaluation, execution will just discard the evaluation of spin, it will dive into the division by zero, and it will violate the, the division's precondition. So this function exposes a problem that call by value style typing is just unsound under call by need evaluation, because it can report erroneous code as OK. So for the rest of the talk, we're going to build a sound and precise refinement type checker for call by need evaluation. So a refinement type checker takes as input some code with some specifications and returns OK if the code satisfies the specifications and otherwise it reports an error. So it consists of three parts, typing, logic, and SMT solving. At the beginning, it creates typing constraints from the source code and then it reduces the typing constraints into logical verification conditions and at the end, it checks the validity of the verification conditions using an SMT solving. Now, given that, we want to refine the type check our function angle. So we know anything. We, we know nothing about the argument x. So we assign the type that says x is a value such as true. We know that y is a value that it is exactly equal to zero, and also we know that z satisfies the predicate false because it came as the result of the function spin. Now, under this assumption, we want to check that actually y is a valid argument for the divisor operator. So we want to check that the type of y is a subtype of the second argument of the divisor operator. So now we have the subtype constraint, and we want to encode it as a logical verification condition 
so that if the verification condition is valid, then the subtyping query holds. So <coughs> from the subtyping, we are going to build a logical application that in the left hand side has the information from the environment, and on the right hand side, it has the information from the subtyping. And to do that, we have to encode both the bindings and the subtyping into the logic. So according to Flanagan's hybrid type checking, the meaning of Y has type V such as P is that if Y actually reduces to a value, then P of Y holds. And for now, we're going to encode this to into logic using the implicit sentence, if Y has a value, then P of Y holds. And later, we're going to actually encode this Y has a value into, lo into the logic. So encoding subtyping is easier. We want the meaning of the expression uh, that V such P is a subtype of V such Q. And this means that for every binder Y, if Y has type V such P, then Y has type V such Q. This can be easily encoded to, into the logic as an implication from P to Q. So given this encoding, we are ready to encode the subtyping as a logical verification condition. So first, we encode every binding into the environment, as we saw before. And also, we, we encode subtyping to logic, as we saw before. So our logical verification condition is an implication from the conjunction of the encodings of the bindings to the encoding of the subtyping. So given this, we want to send our verification condition to the SMT solver. But before we do that, we have to discharge this X has a value guard. So under call by value semantics, discharging this guard is easy because by the meaning of call by value, every binder must be a value. So X, Y, and Z are trivial values. So we call this has a value guard as true. Now given this, a false appear as an assumption. So the SMT solver can trivially say that the verification condition is valid. So it soundly reports that our ranking function is OK. So of course, under call by NERC, under call by NERC semantics, binders may not be values. So the question is, how do we encode x has a value under call by NERC semantics? So we built the refinement type checker, and the only thing left is actually to encode this x has a value guard. <coughs> so one may come up with different suggestions. For example, we can just say that we can just ignore the environment, or we can make a call by need to call by value transformation, or we could encode these guards as logical predicates. And for various reasons that we explain in the paper, we see that all these suggestions just don't work. Instead, we make an observation that most expressions probably reduce the value. So our goal is to encode this x has a value, uh, has a value guard if we know that x actually reduces to a value. So here is the meaning of the binder as we saw it before, but now we, we know that x actually reduces to a value. So we give this information into the types using a, a down arrow to label the types, and the down arrow has the meaning that x actually reduces to a value. So the binding now means that if x reduces to a value, then p of x holds, and moreover, x reduces to a value, which can trivially be encoded into the logic as p of x. So this label basically provides a stratification of our types. And at the top level, we have the label types that can be given to expressions that must reduce to values. And on the bottom level, we have the unlabeled types that can be given to arbitrary expressions, meaning that they don't need to reduce to values. So now, Encoding stratified types into logic is quite easy because as we saw, we can encode label types into logic using their predicates. But we know that we cannot trust the unlabeled types because they may correspond to expressions that don't reduce to values. So we have no information from the unlabeled types and we just encode them as true. So with this encoding, we visit an example. We have the divisor operator. <coughs> We have a successful function that given an argument x, it retains a value that is greater than x. And then OK function assign x to 1, and then divides its argument a by the successor of x. Now we know we, we can know that 1 
and that's x, is actually a value, and we can map this information into the binding of x. So now we need to encode this subtype query into verification condition. So we see that we can trust the final of x, and we can assume that x is actually equal to 1, but, don't, but we don't trust any other information from the environment. But the fact that x is equal to 1 is enough information for the SMT solver to prove that the verification condition is valid, and thus that our function is actually OK. So we saw that we can actually use stratification to discharge this x has a value guard. And the next step is to see how can we enforce stratification. So we saw that label types can be given only to expressions that must be values. We also know that terminating expressions must have a value. So to discharge, to, to enforce stratification, we can just use a termination analysis. And how can we verify termination? So we could just use a termination prover for Haskell programs. But instead, we, we know that refinement types can the same be used to check termination. So as an example here, we have a recursive function f that either returns 1 or recursive equals it says. And we would like to verify that the result, uh, that the result type is OK. <coughs> so that um, the label of the result type is OK, which means that we need to verify that f actually terminates or that f of n always has a value. To do so, we just need to check that f recurses only on smaller inputs that have a lower bound. So we can just check that f only calls values v, such that v is less than f actual <coughs> argument n, and v has a lower bound, so it is always greater than or equal to 0. So it turns out that we can encode both this information into a type. So we say that f can only recurse on input v, that satisfy the type that they are greater or equal than zero, or they are uh, and they are less than n. So we use it, this type as f precondition, and to check the termination, we just need to check that f rec uh, recursive calls with this <coughs> with this appropriate type. So if the refinement type checker says that all f calls satisfy this type, then we know that f of n actually has a value. And the result, uh, the result type of f is actually fine. So we use refinement types to check termination. And the nice thing about it is that our termination proofs are actually semantic, which means that the, uh, the termination proofs can use all the information that the refinement has all around the problem. The problem. So for example, we prove that the greater common divisor does terminate using information from the properties of the mod function. So semantic proofs are very nice, but of course we cannot always prove that uh, all our functions terminate. For example, here we have a collapse function. Collapse is known because it either returns one or recursively calls itself. And it turns out that um, it is an open problem whether collapse terminates or not. But we can give it a very nice type that says that if collapse does terminate, it returns a value that it is exactly equal to one. Now, it turns out that this, this information is enough to actually use collage. For example, we can prove that if we divide 42 with the result of collage, it's safe, because collage can either return 1 or divert, and both of these cases do not violate this precondition. So this example shows that termination is a luxury, it's not a necessity <laughs> for our system, which means that we do require termination proofs to be more precise, but we don't need them to actually prove that the refinement type checker is correct. And this is very nice because we can use our refinement type checker to check actually Haskell <coughs> program code that, uh, that, that contains functions that may diverge. So, but we do uh, have termination checks, and as a step, we would like to check if termination is good in practice. So we check termination, if termination is good in practice using liquid Haskell, a refinement type checker for Haskell programs. I'm not going to describe liquid Haskell now, but Derek has a talk on liquid Haskell at the Haskell Symposium tomorrow. So we used liquid Haskell to, to check termination on many Haskell libraries. 
that are, uh, that are more than 10,000 lines of code. And in this diagram, we use the blue column to, to map the number of, of recursive functions that Liquid Haskell can automatically prove terminating. The green one <coughs> is the, the number of functions that Liquid Haskell can prove terminating, but it requires uh, information from the user. And the yellow are the, the, the ones that we couldn't set, either because they do diverge or because Liquid Haskell cannot express their termination condition. So from this evaluation, we can note that proving termination in real Haskell code is actually precise, as 96 of our recursion, of the recursion functions could be proved terminating. <coughs> and it's actually quite automatic, as 61 of the recursion functions were proved terminating automatically. So from this evaluation, we can conclude that actually proving termination is uh, practical. Um, so in the paper, we provide a formalist for our termination proofs and type, type certification. And we, provide, we, we give a proof that our refinement type checker is sound. And we describe how we can use stratified and black data types. We use refinement types to encode infinite data. And we provide more termination proofs. So to wrap up, I presented the refinement types for Haskell. The problem was that under call by need evaluation, refinement types may need termination proofs. And, but we can use refinement types to prove termination which is actually quite effective in practice. Thank you. Can you explain what a stratified algebraic data type is? Uh, yes. So we use these labels to map, to, to distinguish between types that can be given to expressions that always terminate or may diverge. So for example, if we have a, a list type label, it means that this actually returns the list type contractor. It is a Haskell value. Okay, I was wondering, because there's another question I wanted to ask. Um, you've shown how you can prove termination for functions that act on numbers, but, in, but it's not clear to me how you do that for uh, something structurally recursive. Oh, it's not clear. So, um, so basically, if we have a list, we use a logical function that we call measure to map the list to its length which is actually an integer. And then we have to prove, again, that this integer is, the length of the list is decreasing. Okay, thanks. Nice, um, Nikki. Haskell is a very unexpressive uh, language. Everything you can express in Haskell is a type of one up in a strict language. So I'm surprised that your examples don't show up in refinement type systems for strict higher order languages. Do you have an indication why that is the case? Uh, can you repeat that you don't understand? Uh, the first part was propaganda, but it's really true that Haskell, mm -hmm. Haskell is an unexpressive programming language. Mm -hmm. It lacks the first type level. Everything you can do in Haskell, you can do at level n plus 1 in the type hierarchy in a strict language. So I'm wondering why this problem did not show up, did not materialize <laughs> itself in F sharp with refinement types or ML with refinement types. Do you have any intuition oh. why this did not show up there? Why we don't need this labeling, you mean no. these termination proofs? Wh wh why the whole problem does not show oh, up at type level one up? If you just thunk the mm -hmm. example and you un and you and you thaw the thumps in the right division expression, you have exactly the same problem in ML with refinement types. Why does it in practice not show up? We've had refinement types in ML for about 10 years. Yeah, ten yeah. So, so the, the issue is that every time you put something into the environment in ML, you can assume that this actually terminates. Uh, I'll take it off now. OK. Um, oh, from Cambridge. <coughs> 
So you saw that we have refinement types for call by value and not refinement types for call by name. Can you comment about refinement types for call by push value? <laughs> Maybe. <laughs> I have to check the semantics. So Flamadon, uh, the hybrid type system, has um, refinement types that don't depend, depend on the evaluation order. But he actually has this guard. Like, every time he takes something from the environment, he has to prove that this information that you take from the environment is, you can trust it, actually. So if you just ignore the refinements, I guess, uh, if you just ignore the, envir the environment, all the information that exists in the environment, I guess the uh, refinement types are fine. Um, Kenny Throner, uh, Brandeis University. Um, so in the slide where you present the graphs for the different uh, Haskell libraries, um, there was something that struck me, which was that for the vector algorithms library, um, <coughs> you show that every single uh, function needed to be annotated in that, which is uh, seems to be an outlier in this list. Yeah. Um, is there a particular reason why that was the case? Yeah, so we have some uh, default metrics that Liquid Haskell uses to prove termination, and usually it is that the first argument is actually decreasing. Now in vector algorithms, usually what uh, most functions do is that they increase an index. So we have to tell Liquid Haskell, uh, okay, you should not test, test your default, you should invert it. Oh, I see. But so it was quite an easy uh, metric to express. Thanks. Pablo um, Panto, uh, University of Chalmers. I was wondering, uh, it's a great, great effort, I'm wondering how this interacts with other features of GNC, like tag families or, or function dependencies. So we haven't <coughs> verified code that makes heavy use of fa type families. But the good thing about uh, GNC and Liquid Haskell is that we just verify the core. So we ask GNC queries and we get the Haskell core, which is a very small language. So I guess everything you write just translate the core and Liquid Haskell can verify it. Okay, so you, you make this in Liquid Haskell. Is, are there any plans for this slated for THC at some point? Or? Yes. Okay, have. thank you. So, just one or two more. Um, I think this is a very good piece of work, so I really like it. Um, so can you do something like uh, exception analysis, like statically say um, what kind of exceptions will be thrown uh, during evaluations and do it statically? Exception analysis? Yeah. Like a uh, DT errors? Yeah, maybe. I mean, I mean, other I mean, kind of. Yeah, so I think Eric will talk about it tomorrow, but what, what we do is that, so from, from, the, from Haskell to Core, if you go, mm -hmm. DT actually inserts some error function. Okay. So we give this error function a precondition that, that says false, which means that Liquid Haskell can verify that all these functions with a false precondition will never be called. Okay, okay, so uh, I mean, so there already kind of quite much work on like exception analysis for like Haskell or other like uh, functional language like ML. Can you, are you able to characterize if this work is more, um, have more power, kind of, is more powerful and to catch more, um, it, and it can, can do the analysis more precisely? No, we haven't done this comparison. Oh, okay, thanks. Last question. On this slide, did you find any bug? Uh, we found a bug at text, that it was a very small bug, and we posted a pull request and it's fixed.
Okay. So um, the second uh, talk of the session is that there are gradual effects on the speakers within the room. Well, so. Hi everyone, uh, today I'm going to talk about uh, gradual effect checking. And this is joint work with my advisors, Ron Garcia and, and Eric Tante. Um, programs are a bit like medication, in that they produce both results and also may produce side effects. And uh, one of the ways to make these side effects explicit is using type and effect systems. And let's take a look at a a type and effect systems with an example. So here we have a function that we call positive. I'll, I, I will fill the rest of this example later, but let's take a closer look at the function for now. Uh, positive receives an integer argument, and if the argument is non-negative, then it returns it, or otherwise it may raise an exception. And in the simple type system, we may say that positive has a function type that goes from int to int. But this type does not take into consideration the fact that an exception might be raised. So using a type and effect system, we make this fact explicit. Uh, because in type and effect systems, functions uh, carry an extra annotation, uh, which corresponds to the set of side effects that may be produced when the function is applied. And this set works as an upper bound, so, or a conservative approximation for the effects that will be produced. Uh, when something is applied. Another way of, of limiting the side effects is uh, effect description, which is useful to annotate uh, the effects of sub-expressions. And the idea is that an expression E cannot produce more side effects than those declared in the set uh, fee. Um, so let's see an example of using this effect description. So here we have a function called square f, uh, which takes as an argument a uh, function, and it applies it to the square of uh, x argument, which is an integer. And it's, declared, it's a scripting to the empty set, which means that it forces the function application to be pure. And uh, we, have, we, we need to also declare the, the signature of this function. And we can use this in, a, in an example. And we want to see what kind of problems arise when using this kind of type of effect systems. So the question is, which set will we declare for the side effects of function f. So a first attempt is to say that f is pure, and this will make the ascription work. But in this case, it will reject the function positive, because the type signature says that it may raise an exception. Though in this case, since we know that x is an integer, and the square is always uh, non-negative, this exception will never be raised. Uh, and the other option would be to declare that f uh, can raise an exception, and in this case, positive can be a valid argument, but uh, the description does not work. So, and we believe that we want to be able to write programs like this. And so, for this is that we're proposing uh, gradual effects. And we inspire ourselves in the work in gradual typing. So, gradual typing attempts to combine uh, static and dynamic type checking in a single language. And they do so by introducing a notion of an unknown type. The, uh, this question mark. And the core idea is noticing that the type derivation relies on this notion of type equality. So you can introduce an, an, a broader notion of type consistency, so statically the type system can accept more programs uh, where there's unknown information. And we want to uh, introduce a similar notion for effects. So combining uh, static and dynamic effect checking in a single language and we introduce a notion of unknown effects, which we use the inverted question mark for, and Spanish speakers will know why. Uh, but, uh, and we realize that uh, effect checking, uh, since we're using sets of side effects in the annotations, relies in containment to make comparisons. So we need to provide an, a broader uh, definition of consistent containment to make the static system accept more programs. So, uh, in this case, we can introduce this uh, unknown effect annotation, and then this program becomes valid and it's accepted, but we still need to verify at runtime that we never uh, go through the race uh, branch. Uh, so, we follow this trust but verify uh, approach. Uh, another interesting thing is that 
by introducing this notion of unknown effects, we can combine both programs that have effect annotations and those that don't, assuming that, for example, if F had no type annotation, that means that the effects are unknown. Uh, so there are different kinds of type effect systems and addressing different uh, kinds of side effects. For example, exception, as we are using the example, or others for state, I.O. Uh, so our initial question was, do we have to define this notion of gradual effects for each kind of type of existence? And we, we tried to avoid this approach by uh, working on top of a work by Marino Milstein, which provided uh, a framework to define type of effect systems. So this idea is that they abstract certain patterns in type of effect systems, and they provide you with a framework in which you have to define certain things, and they give you, if you follow the restrictions, they give you type safety. Uh, so there's this, you need to define the syntax and like the domain of your side effects, and you need to define a function that is in charge of granting and revoking uh, the privilege to produce side effect. And this is called the adjust function. And it also needs to define a set of check predicates that will be used to verify that whenever a, a side effect is produced, the privilege to, to produce it is available. Uh, so, to exa an example of this, in going back to example, to the example I was presenting, is that in the case of the ascription to to make the body pure, uh, you need to ensure that the 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 set of available side effect privileges is empty in the context of the application of F, and the type system also needs to, uh, for example, to check that whenever it's raising an exception that it has the privilege to do so. So our intuition was that we could take this framework and extend it uh, by adding stuff. So we would add a notion of unknown effects and this and it make this ascription ex explicit. Uh, introduce somehow a notion of gradual uh, check predicates and adjust functions and also provide the runtime enforcement of the effect discipline when there was not enough study information. Uh, what we provide in the paper is that we can create automatically versions of this gradual check and adjust functions from the uh, functions used in the framework. So if you have a system declared for this framework, you can just get uh, gradual typing, uh, gradual effects. And we provide all the necessary runtime enforcement of the effect discipline. So how we generate this gradual check predicates and adjust functions, so we use ideas from abstract interpretation to do so. And that's why we are in this uh, uh, block. So, and what we do is that we provide type safety guarantees also by, and not requiring any extra uh, work over an instance of the framework. And how does the ideas from abstract interpretation are applied here? Um, so we use these ideas to see if our intuitive notions are consistent <coughs> and to try to define uh, everything in a generic way that applies to the whole framework. So let's start for, with our notion of unknown effects or question mark. So what we propose is extending the domain of of the, the side effect privileges uh, to include this annotation for unknown side effects. So we move from this uh, domain of fees to the domain of size. That means that uh, a function that's annotated with this set may generate more uh, side effects than those declared. So. Uh, what does this intuition mean? So we use from asset interpretation the notion of a concretization function. So we define that this notion of unknown effects by with a function that maps from this domain of size to the domain of fees. So what it does that it maps uh, a Kasai that has unknown information to a set of the feasible sets of uh, side effects that might actually be generated at runtime. And if you want more details of how this function is defined, it's in the paper. Um, and we can use this same notion of concretization to define our consistent container. So how are 
how do we know if a uh, site is consistently contained in another? So we move to the domain of the concretization and we verify that at least there's one chance that at runtime uh, one instance of the concretization will uh, be contained from one set to the other. And so now how we combine the dynamic and static effect checking. So first we need to, as I promised, we need to be able to produce these consistent versions of the predicates and of the adjust functions, and we do so by using abstract interpretation. So I'll, I'll, I'll provide now the, the intuitive definitions on how they are uh, justified by using this uh, abstract interpretation, uh, the ideas. Uh, so we give a, a notion of consistent check predicates, meaning that, and it means that there's at least one chance that for one concrete uh, set of effects, then the check predicate will hold in that case. So we cannot discard uh, statically that uh, the, the privileges will not be available. And we will need for uh, later a stronger notion of this definition of check, which we call strict check, that verifies that in every case uh, the, the check predicate will hold for a certain set of consistent privileges. And we also need to provide a, a definition for consistent adjust. So as we had a concretization function that mapped from consistent privileges to a set of random candidates, we also have an abstraction function that, that take, maps from a set of candidates back to the domain of, of consistency. So what we do is that we use this concretization function to see all the feasible candidates for adjust, then we map the original adjust function that we had to each of them, and we regain uh, a notion of consistent privileges available uh, with the abstraction. The, the core idea here is, is being able to uh, manage what happens when there was unknown privileges and see if, if by applying this uh, adjust function you may uh, uh, lose the uncertainty. And how does this work? So like in general typing we have a source language and an internal language and uh, we take programs in the source language and translate it with a type directed translation. And the idea be be behind this two separate languages is that the source language is more flexible, meaning that it uses the consistent check predicates and, and the internal language is more restrictive, meaning that it depends on strict check and, and that means that the translation requires to insert all the required uh, runtime checks that will enforce that no effect invariants are, are, are not valid. And we do so by introducing uh, three constructs in the, in the semantics. Uh, one is has, restrict, and higher order casts. So the idea behind the has construct is that you need to verify at runtime before producing an effectful computation that you have the privilege to do so when you didn't have enough information statically. So, and, and you need also to be able to enforce the, the privilege updates by using uh, this restrict construct that will update grant or revoke privileges depending on the information it had. And the CAS behavior related to uh, the runtime checking of the effect discipline can be mapped to these has and restrict constructs, constructs. But evaluation of CAS needs to introduce more has and restrict constructs uh, to enforce the discipline. The, we ha the translation algorithm is the one in charge of moving programs from the source language and when there was uh, missing information and insert this has checks, and we attempted to provide a form of minimal privilege checks uh, in this has constructs, and it's the details of how we do that is also in the paper. Uh, so we have gradual effects. Uh, we can combine static and dynamic checking of effects in a single language, 
uh, we, to do so, we have this notion of unknown effects, uh, and we provided a way of moving from uh, static restrictions, like the containment, the adjust and the check functions, to a consistent version of them that uh, gives more flexibility. Where do we go from here? So the first interesting thing would be to have an implementation of this, to experiment with it. Uh, there's another student in the lab working on implementing this framework for Scala, for the Scala FX uh, framework. Um, we want to also explore how general tapping in general works with type and effect systems to have the flexibility to go from uh, unitype programs uh, or missing type annotations towards this, uh, this fully static type dif dif and effect discipline. And we're starting to explore uh, how blame behaves with respect to the side effects, and uh, we don't we don't do anything about it on the paper, but there's the work there. I have a poster in the student research competition and we can talk about it later if you're interested of what we think it's, it's gonna work. To conclude, uh, this is uh, trying to present you uh, a new system that provides uh, the flexibility of combining dynamic checking of effects and static checking of effects and range in between uh, to support the interaction between programs with type annotation, with effect annotations and without effect annotations. Uh, and and we also found out that uh, gradual checking and, and gradual disciplines can benefit from ideas in abstract interpretation to validate if the intuitions uh, are coherent. Uh, so that's everything. Then thank you. Now I've got a, I think a simple question. In your very first slide you were uh, assuming that uh, the square of a positive number can't be negative, of course. Mathematically, that's true, but in most programming languages, you're dealing with a limited word length. And does your system of checks need to be modified to cope with that? Uh, I think the idea that I was trying to just make with the example is that you, as a programmer, might have more information than what the type uh, system can have. So the, the type system is going to reject some things that you know that might not happen and that you might want to have extra flexibility to account for that, uh, more than actually the problem of, of, if, an, of if a number is positive or not. I, think, uh, I hope that helps. Your concretization function, does it have to satisfy some conditions? Uh, no, uh, well, I don't have a, a slide with the definition here, but uh, the the idea is that if there's no unknown information, then you get a single two because there's only a case. And that when there, there is unknown information, then you get like all the, the sets that have at least the known information of, of, this, of the privilege. So can you always derive the concurrency function automatically? Or do you have to specify oh. the system? Yes. No, you don't need the concretization function. We 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 provide it. Uh, it's like so you have a a domain of sets uh, of effects. Then it's just we are adding this extra. The the function is depending on your domain. Most 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 people say. Talk about it. We can talk about it later. Sure. Sure. So I think I'm missing something. Okay. Um, so if you're doing dynamic checking and you get to a raise and the dynamic check says you're not allowed to raise an exception here, what are you supposed to do? Ah. <laughs> so, uh, I think that's uh, a small problem of the, of the example I chose. Uh, <laughs> but, uh, because this, this, this question arises when you're talking about exceptions. But, uh, the, the, the key idea that 
I wanted to transmit was that you don't want to produce a side effect if you're not authorized to do so. So you want a uh, computation to stop, uh, for example, uh, if you're not allowed to write something to this or anything else, then you want you don't want to do that. So and you, and you want to to get an error. So it's it's what it's some of what it's programming languages actually do now, but it's it's trying to make it formal in some way. So does that mean it doesn't really apply to exceptions, or in that situation, no. would you raise an uncatchable exception? Oh, what? What, well, we talk about this in the paper too, uh, uh, that saying that this, error, this failure that we produce is not an exception, and the key difference uh, between uh, failing and generating an exception is trying to avoid uh, catching exceptions that you shouldn't be catching. So uh, in, the, in a case that a, a program failing for the effect discipline uh, should should not uh, be able to continue to work. I guess I have a follow-up question, which is uh, the reason why we want to control effects is to reason about the problems, such as by a reorder part of the program. Do we have to get the same kind of reasoning principle with your dynamic monitoring that we would get with the static principle? Uh, yes, in the case there's no uncertainty. Uh, so the idea is that the DA is providing the flexibility to migrate. Uh, because uh, you have, when you have a, a, a language with uh, static uh, effect uh, disciplines, usually this, you, you add an overhead for thinking ahead. And, and there's a lot of code that's typed, but that's not uh, enforce any effect discipline at all. So you want to have a way to be able to migrate uh, towards uh, this uh, way of reasoning. So the idea is, as a final goal, to a final goal to be able to reason about the side effects, but providing you the flexibility to to uh, go beyond that when you are when you when it's constraining you. But if, right. if I'm given a, a program by screen by someone else, how do uh -huh. I know whether there is some uncertainty inside? Do, do I, I just check for the presence of this? Reverse question mark somewhere in the source code, and please be careful when reasoning about it. Or oh, I think that that's related to the issue of blaming that we are trying to work out. Okay. Uh, so we can talk about that later. Last question. Yeah. Yes. Uh, does your system allow parameterization on effect sets? So if you have that f a system uh, that a square function, you can uh, say that uh, it has whatever effects f has? Uh, yeah. We're not, this uh, formatization does not, but the work for the implementation requires it because the, the framework, uh, the Scala framework, has this way of parameterizing over the effects. So it's future work. Thank you. Thank you for the